The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome people from around the world. <laughs> a good friend of mine opens his program like that, so I thought I'd copy off him. Welcome people around the world. And literally, it's true. Uh, we're a sm- very small congregation, but at the same time, uh, Stina sent me a, a, a YouTube that I had done some years ago. 21,000 views on this topic. So uh, this is going to be a refresher, and I'm going to update. Don't you get that on your computer, updates? Well, this is an update of that message from God knows how many years ago. But uh, we're we're living where the culture is inundated with fear. And I believe we have to have solutions as believers. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. And there's enough torment in the world. You don't need to be living in it. Uh, Fear not. 365 times in the Bible, fear not. Uh, God wouldn't tell us to do something that was impossible. Uh, and besides that, it's the wrong kingdom. And uh, w- we teach uh, a great deal on the emotion area because that's been the neglected area in the church. But in reality, God is an emotional God, and the kingdom of God is... What is the kingdom of God? Everybody knows that one. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness is love and action. You could very easily say the kingdom of God is love, joy, peace. Oh, maybe we're not so much, Maybe we're more religious than in the kingdom. Is that possible? Huh? If the kingdom, the rule of God in your life, let the peace of God rule, there it is. That's love resting. That's love ruling. It's the God emotions that where the failure has been to understand. Jennifer went, uh, uh, well, I think before we got married uh, many years ago, she went to a conference on joy. She said they could tell you everything the Bible said about joy, but nobody had any. So, you know, we, <laughs> I think we're missing the point here, right? We need experiential knowledge. You know, John, John Wesley taught the quadrilateral, and they changed the nation in that time, and he was basically heresy-free. But you know what the quadrilateral is? is everything is under the Scripture as the ultimate authority. But then there was other criteria, like can you experience it spiritually? Can that word be experienced? Can it, can it be even reasonable based on the Word of God? Scripture interpreting scripture, not isolated text, but in, in, in a comprehensive way. Um, did the, is it, can you find it in the book of Acts? Can you understand like in the first century church, I don't want to talk about first century, not later on when people added this and that to it, but in the first century, could you find people that the early church fathers teach it? That's healthy Christianity. Uh, later on, you know, things change. Uh, but the one thing that hasn't changed is God says, fear not. Old Testament, New Testament. So we have an obligation to understand it better. Now, we already did one series on that that uh, has gotten uh, quite good results. But uh, remember, fear is the wrong kingdom. Everything under the kingdom of fear is is evil. And invariably, someone will always ask me, but isn't there a good fear? Well, yeah, if you're going to get hit by a car... Uh, fear might get you to jump out of the way. If someone's going to attack my wife, I just might shoot him. Because, you know, every good lawyer will tell you, what's he tell you? I feared for my life, and so I shot him, <laughs> you know. But the, the point is you don't live there. You don't live there. You don't abide in that rule, that kingdom rule. Some people have lived their whole Christian life in low-grade anxiety, and there's a solution to that, a very loving solution, because perfect love casts out fear. Anxiety is just another word for fear. And yes, there's trauma, and then there's fear. Our culture has a tendency, you have to watch those words, because there's serious trauma, and I deal with it on a pretty regular basis lately. Uh, People that have gone through all kinds of stuff uh, including accidents and other things, to deal with the trauma. But in my day as a young pastor, the word was abuse. 
my wife burned my toast. She's abusing me. You know, I think we, we get to the point where we catch on a legitimate word, and there is horrific, legitimate abuse. I'm not downplaying that because I dealt with it um, in people's lives all through the years. But don't exaggerate it and start using words like abuse and trauma when a lot of times it's not a trauma, it's a fear. Very basic anxiety, and it can be dealt with very easily. Actually, trauma can be dealt with. You know, if you're allowing Jesus to do it and not some man-made technique, if Jesus is doing, big and little doesn't exist in the kingdom. Is it easier for him to say, like he said, your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk? Now, for us, there's a distinction there, isn't it? It'd be easy to tell somebody your sins are forgiven than it is take up your bed and walk and get the instant results. But for God, there is no big or little. And the thing I'm concerned about is that even secularly, they have proven any individual can make something big or small in their minds. There's kids that were raised in the ghetto without any, any benefit whatsoever, and they amounted to something because they saw the, the, the resistance that was real, but they overcame it. The story of that one boy it, it didn't want anybody to look at him as being so poor he didn't have food, would take two pieces of bread to school with nothing in it just so he could look like he had a sandwich. And... And years later, they found him to be highly successful, where everyone else will use it as an excuse. Well, you don't understand the way I was brought up. You know, you don't understand. Uh, and, and I believe that God's going to uh, do a real number on this, changing the culture to a kingdom culture and not being so brainwashed by the current culture. And we're going to have to deal with fear because the current culture is, operates on fear. And fear wants to isolate you. And I, I've said, I prayed with, with adults that as a little child, the demons would basically say, mom and dad are having a knock down, drag out fight in the living room and, and it's horrible. So I'm going to go run in my closet and hide. And so you go in the closet and hide and guess what? It is safer than it was out there in the midst of. But on the other hand, demonic activity will, will convince even a little child, don't play fair and say, you're safe in here. I will keep you safe. So I don't want fear keeping me safe. That's not safe, but it will use that because the greater fear is out here. So I'm the lesser fear, but I will keep you safe. We've got to expose that and get some free. We're going to get some freedom here. Those that are watching uh, by video, uh, expect to sense the deliverance because we, we've seen this our whole life in traveling church to church, and it just happens. And the interesting thing is, is this deliverance is really closing the door. You can, you can, uh, you have the authority as a believer to push back the powers of darkness around somebody, but you don't have the authority of their will. Their will is crucial to closing the door to the enemy so that they stay free. Okay? Now, I'm going to cover some uh, general things. On, on uh, How many have ever heard of the DISC? Department of Navy uses it. Certain businesses use it. Okay? The enemy knows you better than you know yourself. And he will attack you based on your temperament even. Did you know that? Your temperament. In other words, your strength can become a weakness because he knows what your strength is so he can mess with you. All right? The, the, uh, uh, just to give you a, a quick uh, DISC. Uh, for those that have never had anything, I'm just going to give you a, 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 the kindergarten version. Uh, D stands for dominant. That's the personality who's in your face, confrontive, decisive, uh, natural born leader. Um, the D is dominant. I, they, they're inspiring, they're creative, they're active, they're people, they're fun people, they're, they're in the party, they're the talker, they're the, okay? Then there's the S, the supportive. That's the one who family and don't change anything. S for stability. Don't rock the boat. I'm not going to rock the boat. And the C is the cautious one, uh, factual, okay? Now, the strength, uh, well, let me give you the easier example. This is the way I learned it because the guy that owns this is a multimillionaire now, and uh, the guy that owns the title to this, I was in his first class. He experimented on us back in 1985. I got my credentials to teach this. And he says, I think I found my niche. 
because he was a, uh, a prophetic preacher and uh, he was also a brilliant businessman. And there's times we used to hang out and he'd struggle like, am I a businessman who preaches or am I a preacher who does some business? And you know, that could be a real pressure because that's an identity thing. And you're good at both. The religious people wanted him to be just a preacher. The business people said, you ain't got time for that. All right, so eventually he went and uh, Bishop Hammond uh, said, gave him a word once years ago. And he says, uh, your dilemma is you don't know if you're a businessman that preaches or a preacher that does business. He says, you're a businessman that preaches. And he said the disc, he, f he found his niche. And so he, he owns the copyright to all of this. The U.S. Navy, these are his clients, Department of Navy, Sylvan Learning Systems, you know. I mean, he's got clients, Standard Oil, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, but my concern is that if the enemy tailor makes his attack against you, he knows your personality, he knows your strengths and weaknesses. So uh, the strength of a D would be they're driven, independent, determined, competitive, and goal-focused. As a matter of fact, they're so goal-focused. Uh, I learned it by the illustration of getting on the elevator, and this is the easiest way to understand. The D, there's a crowd of people going to get on the elevator. The D, the decisive one, is on a mission. So he goes up, presses the button, door opens, he walks in, presses the button, closes the door, and leaves all those people outside. <laughs> Because he's on a mission. His priority and his temperament is, I've got to make it to the third floor. There's a meeting. Okay? The I, on the other hand, reminds me of my dad. Press the button, gets on the elevator, and there's a crowd of people. And he goes, hi, my name is Lloyd. What's yours? How many kids do you have? I've got these many grandchildren. And between the first and second floor, he knows everything about everybody. That's the I temperament. You identify with that? That's the talker. All right? Life of the party. The third guy, the S temperament. He goes up to the elevator and looks. Oh, man, there's like 10 people waiting to get on this elevator. I think I'll just take the stairs rather than upset the boat. I like stability, safety, calmness. I'll just take the stairs. I don't want to be a problem. And then there's the C the factual, they've got the facts, all right? And the facts are for the C when she gets on the elevator and looks up, weight load, 1,200 pounds. <laughs> I seriously think somebody should get off. Okay, does that help? That just gives a real broad, it's much more complicated than that. But that's like the overly broad situation. But what I was seeing was that fear will use your temperament. In other words, even temptation is tailor-made for you. Did you know that? He, the enemy knows you better than you know yourself, and he will pick the areas to attack you on. And so for the D, they're strongly driven, independent, determined, competitive, goal-focused with all that good stuff. Their fear is losing control. Losing control. Win, lose. They don't want to lose because they're what? Competitive. So that's, that's a real genuine fear for them. It would bother them more than other people being taken advantage of. Being a boss at work and feeling like somebody's trying to usurp your authority. Somebody's jockeying for position. Whoa. Push your button. And I don't want to lose because then I'm vulnerable. People will take advantage of me. They will see me as weak. See, this is a natural born, in your face person. That's a strength, but the weakness would be being taken advantage of, seeing, appearing to other people that I might be weak. When a D goes to get ministry, they're, they're probably bottoming out sometimes because <laughs> the D would much rather tell you what's wrong with everybody else. It's those people. <laughs> it's those circumstances, not me. What? Remember that guy that raised his hand? He said, he, he used to, uh, 
he talked about knowing all the movie stars when he was single and everything. But when I told him we were doing a marriage thing, I was saying, you know, if you're going to be wrong, be 100% wrong. I don't think I've ever been 100% wrong in my whole life. <laughs> this was, <laughs> in other words, I'm pretty sure she's 99% the problem. I'm pretty sure. But he was never 100% wrong himself, all right? So that's the D. The I, the strength is they're enthusiastic, they're per uh, persuasive, they're good salespeople. Uh, they're friendly, encouraging. Uh, they have wonderful idea formulations and creative. But what they fear is a loss of influence, recognition, disapproval of being ignored, rejected. Oh, uh, we'll be rejected. The S. The strength is they have a methodical approach, a routine. My little nephew would get upset with my mother if she moved the furniture. He wants everything to stay the same. Don't rock my personal boat. I, when, I, when I go into your house, I want to see the couch and the chair where the couch and the chair has always been. All right? Stability. So if the enemy is going to attack them with fear, what would he do? He basically would say, we're going to live in a constant state of change here. <laughs> You're never going to know what to expect. And forget routine. There is no routine. You're not allowed a routine. It's all subject to change. Every day is going to be brand new. Now, there's the, the D would love that because that's adventure. The other one is panicking and having a meltdown because you're changing things. And I don't want to offend anybody. I'll take the stairs rather than offend somebody. Okay, the C, that was the person that was weighing people out thinking somebody should leave because they have the facts. Never want to argue with a C with facts. Okay. But they are reserved. They're, they're task-oriented. Uh, but they're cautious and careful. Uh, they usually focus on the facts, the rules, correctness, protocol, policy. That's their strength. They have an eye for detail. They're problem solvers because they have the facts. Accuracy, quality, analytical, and logical focus. However, if fear was going to get them and push their little buttons, what would he do? Criticize. Tell them they're Wrong. You want to see manifestation? Tell us see temperament that's researched and has the facts. And tell them you're wrong. You know, actually, even in discipling and mentoring people, one of the first things you would do in mentoring somebody is tell them no and see, see if you get a manifestation or not. Some people can't handle no, period, right? But personally, that type is afraid of criticism and being wrong. And st strong displays of emotion, because that's irrational behavior. Okay. Now, that's just the disc. That's my introduction. All right. Now, just as much as he can push your buttons on your temperament, uh, he can attack more effectively some Christians mentally, some emotionally, and some you know, really just their their will. And uh, we covered this in the first part, so I'm not going to labor this, but uh, if he attacks your mind, he attacks you with the unknowable. And to get set free from that kind of a thinking, you have to be able to bring that thought captive to the obedience of God. So if you're, you're getting attacked with thoughts. Now, in some cases... Uh, it's been real hard dealing with people who overthink. I'm going to figure it out. And you can stay up all night figuring it out, but that's fear-based. And you're actually fortifying the fear. You're not figuring anything out. That's like the one who stays up all night long and, and says, I don't know what I'm going to do with that teenage daughter of mine. I don't know what I'm going to do with that teenage daughter of mine. I don't know. Well, 
you get enough sleep deprivation, and when you wake up, it's, you're going to have a conclusion like, I'm going to kill that girl. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep her in the house for the next 10 years. You know, you, 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 fear has lost the credibility of your ability to think straight. And I believe there's a, a, a lot of people that without knowing as a believer how to bring a thought captive. So I want, I want to do that for you because this is something we saw when we traveled to churches. We went to some very well-known churches, and yet at the same time, the congregation as a whole didn't know how to bring a, a, a thought captive. They would go like this. I, 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 I renounce that fear. I, I, I renounce that fear. I renounce that fear. Good luck. Maybe when you get exhausted saying that over and over again, maybe for a few days, hours, weeks, months, years, you might surrender and yield and accidentally do it right. <laughs> and some people have built their theology based on, well, you know, if you just do it long enough and hard enough, I don't know about you, but if I had a choice between going to California by uh, car or airplane, I'm going to take the airplane. You know, I don't care that it worked. Yeah, it worked. But how many times did you have to go around a mountain to get something dealt with when actually God made it much simpler than that? You could have dealt directly with it, and it was instant. Now, here's the way you deal with an ungodly thought. If uh, I had the thought that I'm no good, I'll never amount to anything, I'm a failure. And it's not because you failed, but you have identified as a failure. It's your personhood. Well, the first thing you would do is say, Close your eyes. God, when did that get started in my life? Let's go for a root. Let's pull it out at the root. And this is uh, the one way you deal with it. And you can just say, God, when did that get started? Well, I brought a report card home, and I had all A's and one B, and my father made me feel like a failure. All right? I received forgiveness. For taking in something God didn't give me. Fear and failure. God didn't make any failures. You could fail and not be a failure. So I received forgiveness for that. The moment you get peace, listen, this is important because this is the part they're missing. Because you can say all the right biblical answers and not get results. I receive forgiveness. And when it changes to peace, what actually has transpired is a supernatural transaction, a supernatural exchange. It's exactly the same way you got born again. When you got born again, you asked Jesus to come in, forgive you of your sin. Isn't that funny? It was instant. You didn't have to do it for five years. You didn't have to do it over and over again. You didn't have to say it over and over again. I receive forgiveness, cleanse me of my sin. And when he does, it changes to peace. That is the assurance of your salvation. That's how you know you're born again. You've got peace, peace with God. And then Colossians 2, 6 says, as you received him, just like how you got born again, as you received him, walk, so walk. So in other words, I need to walk in a forgiveness lifestyle. And forgiveness lifestyle does not set the other people free. It sets you free. Forgiveness is unilateral. It's one way. It's not reconciliation. Reconciliation takes two people. Forgiveness is one way. Jesus did it on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He didn't wait till they all came forward and repented. He did it unilaterally. You start walking that way, and I'll tell you what, fear will never get a grip in your life. You are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. You probably have bad theology of what forgiveness is, but if it bothers you, if it bothers if for the subject of forgiveness... The beautiful demonstration of the love of God toward us, if that bothers you, you don't understand it properly from a biblical perspective, and that's common. Do you know in two places in the Bible, Luke 24 and John 20, and those are Luke 24 and John 20, I don't know the exact verse, but I know those are the chapters, where Jesus said to his disciples, go preach the forgiveness of sin. So the gospel of the kingdom is actually a forgiveness message. Go preach that their sins are forgiven. And those are uh, several years apart, those two uh, situations in John 20 and Luke 24. Go preach the forgiveness of sin. 
if that is the beauty of the love message of God towards you, then that should be the beauty of the love message of God. That's where the rubber meets the road, because you go, oh, I love my car, I love these people. I love those people over there uh, out of country that I had never met before. I love them. You know, yeah, that's real easy to love them. But how about, how about someone that's in your face to where you need to release forgiveness? That's where the rubber meets the road. That's the love message of Jesus. That's the kingdom of God is love, joy, peace. Romans says, righteousness, peace, and joy, but righteousness is nothing more than love in action. So you could say the kingdom of God is emotional, but it's God emotions. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not carnal emotions. Carnal emotions are an open doorway to the demonic, and everything in the demonic realm is fear, fear-based. So we need to learn how to handle fear, because that's the wrong kingdom. And God said, fear not. And a mature love casts out fear. What would a mature love do to cast out fear? What if somebody really did you wrong? You release forgiveness, and whatever they did has no longer an effect on you. There's peace. You will remember it. And this nonsense about forgive and forget, you have to understand that properly. You don't forget, and neither does God. Well, God will throw it in the sea of forgetfulness. The forgetfulness is he's no longer holding it against you. He's not an amnesiac. Every, every sin that David did is in the Bible, right? But later, in the book of Acts, he says, David is a man after my own heart who will do all my will. We would and say, well, wait a minute. Hit all your will? You know. See, we don't understand the redemptive purpose of the love of God. We don't understand that. I'll tell you where you do forget it. If you, do, if you forgive properly, if you repent properly, if you do it, and most of the church, unfortunately, doesn't do it right. They, they're sincere, and there's nothing harder than to tell a sincere person you're doing it wrong. But when it's done right, there is peace. And the pain, the hurt, the fear, the lust, the rejection, the shame, the guilt is erased from your spirit. That's where you get clean and it gets erased. It does not get erased from your memory. It gets erased from your spirit. That's where it goes forget. It's forgotten. It's no longer and held against you in a practical way. But you remember it. Matter of fact, it's probably good that you do remember it. So what? In some cases, don't do that again. Right? If you're not properly healed, you will do the same thing over and over again. The woman that marries five alcoholics in a row. You know, who's at the scene of every crime here? You know, it's the woman that's done it five times. It's not just the alcohol as a problem. The problem is, if you would have resolved it and learned from it the first time, those successive fours would not have existed. But you're prone to repeat anything that's not dealt with. You see something that's happening over and over and over again? There's something that hasn't been dealt with. There's a root. Now, this battle for overcoming the fear, you know, we need to know that uh, there's some things I'll never know instead of overthinking. Overthinking is a sign that you're not really trusting God because God says, uh, inquire of me. There's some things you're supposed to seek out. Wisdom searches out a matter. It's the wisdom of kings to search a matter out. How many evangelicals who didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, instead of just saying, that's New Age, which the church talks like that often, which, by the way, you're calling, and if you don't know what you're doing, you're calling the Holy Spirit the devil. That's really, biblically, that's dangerous ground. But if you were to say, those people speak in tongues over there, and I'm a good evangelical, and I love God, but... If you were to say, God, if that's you, show me, would have been a better approach. There are many to this day that have moved into charismatic circles that were good, solid Baptists. They loved the Word of God. They found it, But they inquired, is there more? Is there something I don't know? Instead of just judging them as of the devil. Uh, you're going to have to be a little, real careful with the 
throwing out terminology, anything you don't understand. Give me a 30-year Christian who hits on a subject they don't know anything about, and they'll say, that's got to be New Age, that's got to be a cult, because after all, I've been in the church 30 years, I know everything there is to know. <laughs> if I don't know it, it can't be true. All right? Now, all right, God knows everything. His word's going to be a lamp to your feet. Uh, revelation enlightens the eye. Uh, you draw near to God, he'll bring you forth. Uh, but the thoughts, the thoughts are easy to deal with if you get the power behind it. Now, I was raised in faith camp um, in the early years of my Christianity, and it was, it was uh, I, uh, certain scriptures they use over and over again, and that's good. But one of them was uh, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Right, But the primary interpretation with everybody I was around, the power of the tongue was the words. Right? Does that make sense? But I saw this by the Spirit. I, I, discerning the human spirit is extremely easy for me from the time I got filled with the Spirit. And I would feel a, a duplicity here. There, there was, they would say the right answer, but they, here's the way it would feel to me. when I'd be, They'd be saying the word, a good scripture, Perfect love, perfect love casts out fear. A perfect love casts out fear. A perfect love casts out fear. And I would discern the fear. And I'm saying, all right, life and death are in the power of the tongue, but they're looking at the words. Satan can quote scripture. They're looking at the words, but not the power behind the words. And for me, that was life-changing because then everybody that came for counseling ended up getting quality ministry, and I was getting a reputation as the best counselor in the little region. Uh, I'm just saying that because I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that because what I did was so simple that we've done it to little children age. When it was the youngest, we did three years old. Three years old got emotional healing, and they're easy. <laughs> A little easier to deal with than adults who already know. I already knew that. <laughs> I already dealt. Oh, here's my favorite one. I already dealt with that. Or my other favorite one. I can't think of anybody to forgive. Your mind. This is the science part, right, Jennifer? Jennifer teaches me the science of everything that I do spiritually. She says you can back it up scripturally and scientifically. Here's the scientific, that at any given second, right now, up here you could have as many as 2,000 thought patterns, brain processes, thought patterns. And these brain processes could be, it's getting a little warm in here, I don't know what time is this going to be over with, uh, oh my goodness, I can't take notes, he's talking too fast. I'm, um, 2,000. In your non-conscious spirit at any given second, 400 billion thought processes. I can't think of anything. <laughs> Maybe you should try going to God in that unknown area. David did it. He said, he said uh, Psalm 19, search me, O God, for secret faults. Well, who are they secret from? Not the ones that I'm keeping secret from everybody else. No. God, search me for secret faults. In other words, I don't know that I know. Search me. And when God searches, he'll go to those 400 billion that no counselor, no psychiatrist, and no deliverance minister is going to know enough. If God knit you together in your mother's womb, he's the one that can untie the knots the most efficiently. Now, God will use uh, deliverance ministers. God will use counselors. Thank God for them. There's some people who wouldn't be with us today if it wasn't for them. But on the other hand, there is, there is a simpler way of going to Jesus. Early years of Christianity, matter of fact, there were many Christians uh, who were pretty well adjusted when they got saved had no tolerance for people that weren't adjusted after they got saved because they said, you've got the Bible, you got Jesus, we don't need counseling. Hmm? And that was the argument. Well, what we did was we says, look, that was an interim period of time, but if God brought 
and return the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus, the simplicity of a life with Jesus, would you take the easier way? When we travel, we even have people that got such quality deliverance and emotional healing so quickly, they said, that's too easy. Do you have peace? Test the spirit. If it's God and you test the spirit and you got peace when you did it, try a day later. Close your eyes. Picture the same exact scenario, the exact same scenario, and peace will be there. God will not remove his peace, and the enemy can't penetrate that peace. He cannot touch the fruit of the Spirit. Our God's an emotional God, and I just love it because the church threw out emotions. Can't live by your feelings. No, you can't live by those carnal feelings, but you can't ignore them. They're telling you Jesus isn't ruling here. Utilize them as a signpost of where you're being attacked from the wrong kingdom. Be aware. And you say, well, I'm not a touchy-feely person. The men will say that. Well, that's a woman thing. All right, well, men, I have no tolerance for that kind of talk. Because what you like to use, men, stress. I don't have emotions like those women. I have, Jennifer says, I've seen you on the road. You've got emotions. They're just not good ones. <laughs> but then stress, the definition of stress means to be, men, emotionally controlled by people and or circumstances. Well, you told me you didn't have any emotions, but you're telling me you're stressed. Guess what? That's emotional. And it's either a circumstance, situation, or a person. I can show you how to deal with that right away, even though you've accepted stress. <laughs> and your employer will tell you stress is good so you can get more out of you. <laughs> that could be manipulative, couldn't it? Oh, well, it's good stress. Well, we're going to get to what it does to your physical body real quick. Yeah, we're going to do some more. We need to do some deliverance on this before we get farther. How many feel like you need deliverance? Oh, there's, there's at least, there's at least 10,000 people online who say, I do. <laughs> then receive forgiveness for taking in the fear for any situation that comes to mind. Look how simple it was. This is why it worked with three-year-olds. We would say, okay, honey, close your eyes. This is a little girl that was afraid to go to bed without a light on. Does that sound like a legitimate fear. I don't want to go to bed without a light. I'm afraid. I kept running out of the bedroom because I'm afraid. And we had her close her eyes. I said, you have Jesus in you? And she went, mm -hmm. And I said, then we're going to receive forgiveness for being afraid because Jesus doesn't want you to be afraid. And she received forgiveness. And I could feel her little spirit change to peace. And plus, kids don't fake it. She got a smile on her face that quick and I said that feel good mm -hmm. and she told her mom and dad that night the very night from the time we pray you don't have to leave the light on because Jesus and I are going to bed now <laughs> and it lasted how about the boy we just saw what is he now I saw it on Facebook a dentist. Yeah, he's a dentist now. But we did young children. He was in the third grade and missed a week of school because he accidentally killed his pet rabbit. He fell, tripped on it. And so in his little emotional state, he's a murderer. And uh, I, so the teacher told me what was going on. So I, I did my altar call like that. Anybody have anything bad happen to them today <laughs> or lately? And he was the first one to raise his hand. I said, come on up. And I, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. It was an accident. And we got him to forgive himself because he was condemning himself as some kind of a murderer when he knew it was an accident, but he was in a mental dilemma between the way the emotions feel and, and that. He received forgiveness. He got that smile on his face. Went back to a seat, but then it started a chain reaction. I overfed my fish, and I need to pray. I, my grandma died during the summer. My dog ran out in the street. In a matter of seconds, they all 
they all dealt with it progressively, and then he raised his hand. I have a revelation. I'm going, okay, this is a third grader with a revelation. I feel like my rabbit is playing with her dog in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> then years later, when he was a teenager, he said, hi, uh, you remember me? And I'm, no, he goes, I'm the rabbit boy. <laughs> and to this day, we just saw it on Facebook. He's a dentist. And so it lasts forever if you do it right. Nobody can take it away. If you do it right, once it's like being born again. You don't have to get born again over and over again. If you got born again and you felt peace, there was that supernatural exchange. Nobody can take that peace away. You'd have to throw it away. But God isn't going to remove his peace. He himself is your peace. All right? So now, uh, with the will, that's the mind. All right? The will is down here. And when we would go to large churches of over a thousand people, and it was very disappointing. I'd say, point to your will. And 98% pointed to their temple. Your will is here. So we would have them even do exercises, stand against the wall and go back. It's unnatural to go backwards and fall. It's unnatural. You would have to yield your will to even do it a little bit. Did you notice that it's down here? Did you notice when you see somebody that's threatening to you or you don't want to be around them, the first thing you do down here is go, oh, there's, oh, there's Ralph. He's coming down the aisle in the grocery store. The last person I ever want to see, he fired me two years ago. This is self-preservation. This is fear. Yeah, you didn't protect yourself. When you did this, if Ralph comes down and says, oh, I hope you found a job or says something sarcastic, it goes right through that and your wounds. It's like the scripture says, the wounds of a gossip are like tasty morsels that go down into the innermost rooms of the belly and they stay there. What should you have done? There's Ralph coming down the hall. Oh, that's kind of like the last person I really want to see. He's been known to pick on me. Oh, Jesus. That's all you would have had to Jesus. Acknowledge him here and maintain your peace. And I don't care what Ralph says. It can't penetrate the peace of God. Fear cannot touch the fruit of the Spirit. The God emotions are kingdom. Righteousness, which is love and action, peace and joy. The kingdom of God is love, joy, peace. Wow, those are emotional. How come nobody ever taught me that? Well, because they were doing seminars on the fruit of the Spirit, but nobody had any. <laughs> or, I had, a, I had joy once. <laughs> All right, that's not a testimony. We're supposed to be steadfast and patient with joy. That would require a kingdom anointing, wouldn't it? steadfast in circumstances, that's all of life, patient with people, that's all people, good, bad, and ugly, with joy. You cannot do that without the Holy Spirit. But you can learn to practice the presence of God in a more substantial way on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Now, when I married Jennifer, she was a head person, and I called her a little much afraid, like the, the character in Hind's Feet in High Places. And the sky was always falling, even when there was no rational proof. And so I said, Jennifer, drop down to here until you get your peace. And I go, there, that's it. And she had the corroboration that was necessary. But she was like a yo-yo. She didn't stay there very long. She went, oh. and, and even when she's not talking, she would have that anxiety. And I would discern it. And my favorite story was the one in the car. We're, we're getting ready to go do a whole circuit of churches up in Connecticut. And I'm in the car, and all of a sudden, the car floods with this. And nobody's talking. But there's all this anxiousness. And I'm going, Jennifer, what are you thinking? And she goes, I just wonder how we're going to move all this furniture and change houses and then we're going to go up to Connecticut and how are we going to get back and what are we going to do? And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what you emanate. You can fool people with your words. You can even 
fool them with your body language and your gestures, but you can't hide what's emanating. You want to emanate the fruit of the Spirit and the peace of God. And it's militant. It's powerful. It's not passive alone. And Jennifer got better at staying down. I did have to, I did have a little few little cheat methods. One of them was Jennifer, close your eyes, because when your eyes are open, you're too busy thinking. <laughs> yeah, not that you can't think with your eyes closed, but you have a tendency to drop down to your spirit better with your eyes closed. <clears throat> All right. So the will. The good news is freedom is expressed within a uh, within a law. And the law of love is what we want you to surrender that will to. That will uh, operates, the law of the spirit of life has made you free from the law of sin and death. So to be free from the kingdom or law of fear, there has to be a supernatural exchange. You give power to what you obey. Once had a girl in my church that was, uh, she was anorexic, she was under a lot of, this, uh, counseling care and uh, she had she even lost uh, her, her baby was taken by uh, human services uh, because she would start out for church leave five minutes and turn around and go back home then she said no I gotta go to church and she'd get back on the car she'd go up five minutes and then back back by the time she came into church we were about five minutes from being over and I asked her one time if we could uh, eat together, if she would eat if I ate with her. And she said, yeah. And guess what she opened up? She opened up a can of slimy clams. And I'm going, oh, out of a can. And I'm going, oh, man, am I paying the price for this? I'll eat with you. Well, I had no idea that's what she was going to eat. But anyway, she told her counselor, and she was making uh, her psychiatrist, and she was making a lot of progress. What, when, when she started making the progress, he said, what did, you, what did you do that all of a sudden you're getting better? And she said, my pastor told me one thing, that I get power to what I give attention to. You give power to what you give attention to. So you have the capacity to focus. You choose what you focus on. You give power to what you give attention to. And she started making prog progress. I prayed for another one in my church that she was in a fetal position. She was in an abusive case. Uh, she had to leave her husband for the protection of her child. And uh, she was so upset she was in the fetal position in the, bar, uh, in the psychiatric ward. And she kept calling my name. So they said, we're not getting any response. You go. And I went and I saw her. And literally just t telling her that it, the, it's like you have to say repeatedly. And this is a strategy we use even on uh, phone coaching. I don't know about that. But that's not God. I don't know about that, but you need God. I don't know about that, but there's hope. I don't know about that, but there's hope. Our problem is we, you want to get in dialogue with someone that's irrational. It's not going to do them a bit of good. You're better off honestly saying, I don't know about that, but, and point them to Jesus. We should be like sheepdogs pointing them to the solution, not getting off on some tangent argument that they have that really is going nowhere. And in most cases, it's an excuse not to deal. Maybe not on purpose, but it is. I don't know about that, but unless unless we take this to Jesus, yes, there, he's your hope. He's your hope. And literally watched her go from the fetal position to straightening out while she was on the bed. And they were so impressed that, that she, she got such progress. I wasn't a great counselor. I just pointed her to Jesus, for heaven's sakes. Now, you get the reputation. I thought it was amusing. I got this reputation. Even mental health was sending me people, and I was finding quite a they said I had a Christian friend. He was a Harvard graduate, uh, and uh, his brother was a counselor for mental health, and he said, Dennis gets results all the time. It's like he's got like a claw. It goes right inside, and it takes, it out. <laughs> it takes the junk out. And I'm going, no, that's Jesus doing that. I don't do that. 
but they sent me a guy who thought he was Elijah. And when there's thunder, that's God talking to him. And they didn't know what to do with him. They knew it was obviously it was a religious uh, thing. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, God, help. I don't want to. And all of a sudden, it's just like a little word of wisdom came down. Ask him and let him know, do you know that everybody, except for Jesus, but every great man and woman of God in the Bible, at some point or time, they were wrong. Do you realize that? I mean all of them, all of the greats, all the prophets, all the apostles. At one point or another, they did something that was wrong. Is it possible that you might not be Elijah, that you could be wrong? Yeah. And he, he went home, went back, and they said, he's making wonderful progress. It was a start. It wasn't a tall ball of wax. What was the other situation? One in the born-again believer. She was part of a church. She'd have her episodes. And one of them was she believed the CIA was coming in and injecting her. And the fear that would come from her when she's talking about it was immense. And nobody knew what to do, including the resident psychologist was also a Christian in the church. Her, That was her client. And she asked me if I could pray. I prayed with her. You know what I had to do? It sounds kind of silly, but I had her face her fear. You know those CIA people? When you, when you, when you think of them, what do you feel? And the fear manifested. It was actually demonically manifested. It was emotional and demonic, of course. And I says, I want you to release forgiveness for them violating your house. I'm having her forgive imaginary people. And she did, and it changed the peace. And she was did remarkably well from that time on, according to her psychologist. Guess what? You have imaginary fears. So don't look at her like she's kind of off the, off the charts. You have things that you're afraid of that don't even really exist. You brought it upon yourself. So it wasn't that far-fetched after I thought about it, but all I knew is I wanted her free from that fear. When Jennifer got her first healing from a tachycardia, 20-some years, and her, her late husband was a medical doctor and said there's nothing they can do. You, it just If it doesn't stop, you die. And her heart would go like this. Well, one night we're lying in bed, newlyweds, a couple months. And all of a sudden, the room filled with fear. Nobody's talking. The room filled with fear. And I said, Jennifer? And she goes, I'm having one of those. One of those attack of cardio thing. I said, all right, you know what to do. Down in the gut, did you let the fear in? Uh-huh. I receive forgiveness for taking in something God didn't give me. This is while she's having the palpitations. I receive forgiveness for taking it in. She got her peace, and the demonic activity left the room. And her heart went normal, and it's been that way for how many years now? 25 years, where that was a regular part of her adult life. So even physical healing... If, as a matter of fact, I'd like to skip that. I've got a few minutes, but I'm going to skip over to the emotions. Um, your emotions belong to God. So if you're going to live with toxic emotions, at least be aware that I'm not. Jesus isn't ruling in my life. I might be a Christian, but he's not ruling. He's not Lord at this point in time because let the peace of God rule. Let him umpire, let him call the shots, and let him reign. Continue, like Bill Morford said, uh, he did the One New Man Bible. He said, what's missing in our concept of real living Christianity in our Bibles is the word continually. He said, if you really read the text in the Greek, there's a lot of it that we just read it, but it actually says continually. Remember that woman that got healed by Jesus? He says, your faith has made you well. Now, in the Weiss translation, it'll say it with the continually. It'll say, now, go 
in that state of peace and continually be healed of your affliction. See, uh, the will of God is like a river. It's a flow. It's not a choppy, uh, make a decision now, make a decision later. It's meant to be a flow. But here's something. Uh, the, the toxic emotions are the devil's playground. And as believers, you have a solution. Uh, you're the devil's playground. Fear is the overall kingdom. Under that banner, there's hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, but it's under the banner of fear. 95% uh, of the people have it, <laughs> fear, anxiety, or worry. Uh, fear and money. You can be wealthy or poor and still have fear. Uh, those who have it are afraid they uh, don't have it, won't, are afraid they won't get it, and the ones that have it are afraid they'll lose it. I mean, you, can, you can do it whatever way you want. Um, but it's a prison cell, and we talked about the two-headed dragon. So you've got to make sure that you're not buying into um, fear, doubt, and unbelief. Come in and lie to you that it's wisdom. Well, now you've got to be careful. Well, careful is a good thing. But you can, you can bring a spirit of fear in there with your warning, too. Um, but here, here's, let's cover, <clears throat> Jennifer's got a joke in my notes here. I got to read the joke, right? This is one of your favorites from way back. Garfield, the Cape Crusader. He runs into a pet shop and flings open all the doors of the cages, sounding, freedom, freedom. But the terrified animals reach out their paws, slam the door shut again, whimpering, security, security. <laughs> I hope we're not doing that, right? I'm secure in this closet. I'm secure never leaving the house. These, these illustrations are too real for me. Uh, this is not just a teaching for me. I've seen these take their effect, and you need to apply them yourselves, and it can work for you. We shared a lot... I'm repeating a lot of the stories from the last week that we taught on fear. But the agoraphobic woman, that's what they would call it, agoraphobia, the ones that won't come out of the house. It was when we went in Mexico with a team of pastors. And I'll close with this story because there's someone out there who needs to hear these stories more than they need my teaching. Because um, we're going to see deliverance take place today, right in their homes, watching the video in this room if it's necessary. I have all supernatural people here. I mean, but there's plenty of people that need this. And the agoraphobic woman, was uh, she was a street prostitute in Mexico. And the pastor was beside himself. He wanted to help her and he didn't know what to do. She was in a room. She got pregnant as a prostitute, got a baby. And her and the baby stayed in one room and wouldn't go out and wouldn't let nobody else hold the baby. Mother, parents, nobody. Uh, so she stayed there and wouldn't, wouldn't let go of the baby. And so they said, well, there's some American pastors that are here. Let's see if they can do something. Well, anyway, it was actually quite simple. Her eyes were as black as two pieces of coal. She, she was willing to meet with the American pastors. Probably a novelty. I don't know. Her eyes were as black as two pieces of coal. She was that possessed there, demonically. Prayed her to reaffirm kind of a sinner's prayer. And when she received forgiveness, I think she was saved at one time. She received forgiveness for her lifestyle. The eyes went instantly normal. And she was willing to come out of the one room that she never left and give the baby to her mother and eventually went to the rest of the house, eventually went outside, and eventually went back to church. But that took months. Before she went back to church, it was several months. But the same way the enemy wants to close you in, you may have to progressively come back out. All right? You see, the agoraphobia is you're, you're confined but coming back out, there was this progression, just the way the enemy put you in that closet. You're saying, I'm coming out. And don't do what those animals did. 
If somebody sets you free, don't say, no, I'm more secure in my little world. You know, people are just scary. I don't know if I want to deal with people. And with, with uh, all this transpired in the last few years in our culture, uh, you can use it safe. Be safe. Save lives. It can even sound redemptive, can't it? But it could very well be extreme fear. Emotions don't die, they get buried alive. And when Jennifer saw the, the efficiency, that was the first thing she said. Well, emotions don't go away. Only Jesus can take them. All you can do is suppress them. So, Father, we're just thankful that we're going to see all that the Lord has for each and every one of us. And the Deliverer lives inside of me. I don't need Joe Heavy Speaker to do this at this moment. I need to know that I am, I am your deliverer, and there's none beside me, says the Lord. I am, I am within you, and therefore I rise up, and I, I receive forgiveness for taking in anything God didn't want me to take in, and I let the deliverer rise up and carry it away. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.